So I want to say uh, a, a few words about the U.S. side, since uh, this is detail that you, you might not know, and it is part of the equation here. Obviously, the United States is playing a huge war, war, uh, role here, and in fact, uh, you can see it in, in these various events, like in the April presidential election, uh, for example. Uh, it was only uh, John Kerry, the Secretary of State, and uh, he got the uh, uh, insulsa, the Secretary General of the OAS, uh, and the government of Spain uh, were the only three uh, forces in the world that didn't recognize the results of the election. And you had protests in the street, just like you had recently. And um, and as soon as and, and then because of pressure from Brazil and other countries in Latin America, Kerry had to reverse his position. So did in Sosa, and finally the government in Spain as well. And uh, then as soon as they did. That was the end of that uh, little movement to, to try and reverse the results of the uh, election, which there was no doubt of the result, you know. For those who just, I'll just mention this, because we actually did a statistical study, uh, and uh, it was very easy to do because you know how the system works there. There's a dual vote. You get a, there's a machine vote, and then you get a paper ballot, and you put that in the box, and then the ballots, 53% are randomly selected, and they actually counted right there. And so the odds of, uh, of actually that election uh, having been stolen, given the result of the recount, uh, or actually the correct way to say it statistically is, the odds of getting uh, the recount result that they did on the day of the election, if the election were stolen, um, it was actually one in 25,000 trillion. Okay? And, uh, this is not surprising because it's such a large sample. And, and so uh, there was no doubt, and yet there was Kerry, and there they were trying to say that for the first time really in the whole last uh, 15 years that the, they wouldn't recognize the results of this election. So this is very important because I think this is how the U.S. has uh, uh, its real major impact. It's true, the money they put in there and they fund these groups, but these people have money. They have most of the wealth and income of the country, and they have the media. But what the United States does is it gives them a certain oxygen, and you can see that now, too, because now that, uh, through the media, that is really the power of the, uh, it's, it's really media. It's, it's, I would say that's most of it. Um, and that's why it's so important, the work that this group does, and all of you do, and uh, who work on this issue, it's, it's really, really important. And you know, you can actually, I want to say this before I go on to some more detail, but you can actually, one thing you can force the media to do is to run corrections. You know, we got two corrections from the New York Times that changed the coverage. You know, one was when they said they reported uh, falsely that uh, the uh, major uh, Venezuelan uh, news stations did not uh, report uh, opposition views or did not give opposition views. And this was obviously false. You can find right on the web. Uh, long speeches by Maria Correa Machado uh, calling for the overthrow of the government. It's something you wouldn't get on national TV in the United States to do right now. And, uh, and so uh, this was false and they were forced to correct that and so other news outlets uh, also uh, changed. They also uh, falsely reported uh, in an op-ed actually by Leopoldo Lopez that the uh, casualties were students, the majority of the casualties the deaths were students killed by the government, which was, of course, false. It's a small fraction, actually, and the majority of deaths are really uh, were responsibility of the protesters themselves. So you can actually do this, and this is something that anybody can do. And, you know, in fact, it's even better if you're not even part of an organization or anything. They'll, they, they, if you if persistent, you can force them to run these corrections, and it, and it really embarrasses them, and it, it forces them to change some of their reporting and stop lying. Uh, and okay, so I want to mention that. And now uh, there was a hearing on Friday in uh, in the U.S. Senate, and of course it was a circus uh, on Venezuela. And why? Because the United States wants to implement sanctions, or the Congress, uh, these these people in Congress want to represent the, uh, they want to have actual some economic sanction uh, against Venezuela. Now this shows something. Uh, I think it's important because it shows a little bit about how 
the details of foreign policy are hammered out in the United States. There's a, the Congress actually has a role. And in the past, that was what uh, we used, people on our side, you know, used the Congress to stop it. Like in the 1980s, you know, we cut off aid to the Contras in, in Nicaragua and, you know, Reagan had to go through the basement of the White House and, and, and almost, uh, almost got to the impeachment stage because of the scandal. So it was a, it was a, it was a move, mass movement. And it was very strong. And you can go back even further, you know, to the 70s, where uh, there were other movements that forced the Congress to take an opposing role. Now, the Congress often takes the other side. It's, it's to the right. Because, and it's the, it's the politics within the United States. It's because you have a Cuba, an anti-Cuba lobby that is, sees this issue very strategically. Uh, and they have neocon allies. They see it strategically because they see, you know, uh, Venezuela supporting Cuba with tens of thousands of barrels of oil in it. They figure they get rid of the Venezuelan government. That they can. Uh, this is a step towards uh, their counter revolution in, in Cuba. And so this is uh, this is part of the story. So it was a real spectacle. I won't go into too much of it. Uh, and, and by the way, it, you know, we still do. Uh, use the Congress. I mean, you know, and just as you did in the parliament here, I mean, the reason that Obama didn't bomb uh, Syria was one, he couldn't get support from here, but two, he couldn't get the votes in the Congress, and that was the anti-war movement in the United States. You don't see them in the streets, I should say us, in the streets, uh, but uh, they're, you know, it's big, and, and that's unfortunately, um, you know, for Venezuela. A lot of people are working on Venezuela, but they're too busy with uh, all the other wars and, and interventions. And, uh, and so uh, that leaves us with the anti Cuba lobby, which is, uh, and, and you have an election year, and so all the politicians get their stomach from the latest uh, polls or nothing at all. And, uh, and so you have this uh, situation where. You know, the lunatics are in charge of the asylum in the House of Representatives, everybody knows that. But here in the Senate, which is supposedly controlled by the, the, the Democrats, you have Menendez, the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, who is, you know, as crazy as he can be on this stuff, and, very, and just wants to get rid of the Venezuelan government. So here is this hearing about sanctions, and you have the spectacle of Roberta Jacobson, uh, who is the uh, top State Department official, Assistant Secretary, for Western Hemisphere, uh, representing the Obama administration and saying, we don't want these sanctions. Our allies, which is the mood in Venezuela, don't want it. And uh, here are these senators uh, fighting for her. And, uh, so, uh, and so you see the same split that you have in Venezuela between you know, her allies, which is you know, people like Capriles, and then you have the senators uh, leading this charge, who their allies are the people who refuse to participate in the dialogue, like Maria Corina Machado and like the uh, other leaders of the protest themselves. So it's an interesting thing, uh, and it's uh, you know we don't know where it's it's going to go, uh, but I think it's going to uh, you know it's really unfortunate there isn't more resistance there. I think you will get. More Congress people standing up, not just to the sanctions, but in I think in the year, year or two ahead, you'll get some people who will take it uh, seriously. Right now, they just don't care because it's not an electoral issue for them, except in the sense that there's pressure uh, from the uh, from the, the far right. So uh, again, I want to emphasize this is where it's so important that you have actual organizing and actual alternatives to the media. Because this is the narrative that they are, uh, they are, they are, they are controlling the narrative, you know? And, and, and if you look at uh, some of the speakers, just tell me when I have one minute. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I thought I was getting close. Uh, the speakers at this hearing, okay, so there's the, there was the, uh, uh, Roberta Jacobson for the State Department. Moises Naim. Okay, whose main qualification is that he was a minister in the government where they really did kill uh, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people in the Caracaso, 1989. And of course, he did not resign. He was part of that government. He gets to come to the Senate and talk about human rights. <laughs> <laughs> then you have Human Rights Watch. Okay, now, uh, 
I have followed their work on Venezuela for many years, and they have a definite political agenda, which they don't really hide all that much. And uh, so they tried to create an uh, impression without any evidence that there was a systematic effort by the government to use violence uh, to repress the protest. And this is false, and, and I wish somebody would uh, take apart the, their latest report uh, the way other people did in 2008 uh, when they came out with a big report. Just to give you, a, I'll, I'll just I'll end right after this. I want to give this example, okay? Because here they are saying there's this systematic effort uh, to repress uh, these protests. And in 2008, they put out this 300-page report uh, about how the government and they said it was a systematic discrimination in the Misiones that they didn't get medicine or whatever. They had one witness, uh, uh, somebody who's 98 year old aunt didn't get medicine at one of the Misiones. And so they said there was a systematic political discrimination. And 118 uh, scholars and, and experts uh, signed a letter challenging them. They had no evidence. And it's very interesting to look at it six years later because there, it never came up again. In other words, uh, they, they had no evidence at, at all. And so I would say that they have no evidence for this allegation as well. And it's very important for people to take that stuff apart, get it in the press, and, uh, and, and counter this narrative that they're, they're, it's, a, it's a very active uh, effort. I wouldn't say it's necessarily organized. They don't have meetings together, but they all have the same uh, agenda, which is to delegitimize and destabilize and get rid of the Venezuelan government. And that's what uh, we have to stop. Thank you very much.